good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you happen to be right now. Uh, I understand we have a very good crowd tuned in today, and we appreciate your interest very much. Uh, we're going to talk a bit today about publishing models. We're going to share some ideas that we have, and we're going to attempt to offer some solutions that publishers might consider as they adapt their businesses to change. We're speaking really from our unique position as part of the Ingram Content Group. At Ingram, we work with a lot of publishers in a variety of different ways, and we also supply tremendous amounts of book content into a variety of different markets. So we're working with publishers, we're working with, with vendors, we're working with accounts, we're working with consumers, and we have an interesting position that we sit in that we're hoping to share with you today. So please uh, feel free to ask questions at the end of the session. Uh, just briefly about us, Larry. Uh, yes, I'm Larry Brewster. I'm, uh, my role here is Senior Vice President of Strategy and Business Development. I've been with Ingram now for uh, almost 13 years, and my background goes back to the beginnings of Lightning Source, where I've spent uh, all my time here at Ingram uh, as we built the, the Lightning Source print-on-demand business. And I'm Mark Wiemet, and I'm the uh, Vice President and General Manager of Ingram Publisher Services. Uh, Ingram Publisher Services is a full-service distributor for about 65 client publishers. So um, the, fundamental, the fundamental question we're asking and hope to answer today is, how are today's technologies, retail models, and shifts in consumer behavior changing the publishing model? And how do I, publisher, author, uh, you know, retailer, etc., thrive using these in the future? Um, uh, as the industry goes through this transition, we're hearing uh, from many publishers who have, you know, concerns about a variety of things. And in general, there's uh, uncertainty regarding publishing, the publishing business, and technology. Many publishers are adapting very, very quickly to the changes in the industry, the changes that technology are bringing to them, but they're also concerned about changes that they don't even see coming. Uh, things that are around the corner, they're adapting to things that are here, but there's stuff coming that they just can't see. As a result of all these changes, too, there's a lot of pressure for publishers to invest in the future of content, while at the same time run and maintain the, the traditional publishing business and the traditional publishing model that they've been uh, employing for many, many years. And that's just stretching their resources very, very thin. There's also pressure on, on margins from a variety of different directions. At the same time, they're really looking for access to more markets for their content. You know, where can I sell the e-books I'm creating? Where, where can I sell, you know, books that I've got lined up for the next several years? So there's, you know, there's search for markets, there's changing markets. How do I reach them? How do I get to them? And in general, I mean, publishers are just looking at survival and relevance. How do I sell more books in general? just across the board. Switching over to retailers, it, it's interesting that the retailer list of concerns is you know, somewhat similar to the one of the publishers. You know, Technology is having a huge impact on the retail marketplace right now. How are retailers adapting to it? How are they thinking about their role in the changes that technology are bringing to the business that they're in? They have to invest in the future of content as well and stretching their resources in a lot of different directions. They want access to more readers, more consumers. They've got to figure out a way to get people to come to them to buy the books and the content that those readers need. And they're thinking about relevance all the time. How do I sell more books? Uh, libraries, <laughs> interestingly enough, have another very similar set of concerns. How, do, how, are, how is technology affecting libraries? How are they going to be thinking about their role in the future? They have to invest in the future of content. Their resources are stretched further, you know, not only by technology and change, but also by, you know, budgets, deficits. That affects libraries very, very significantly, particularly if it's a public library. They're, they're focused on access to content and patrons, and they're really, really focused on survival and relevance. Um, you know, educators, uh, are in a really uncommon position, and they may differ depending on whether that what their field of study is, their student population, 
their status, public or private or whatever. But again, their concerns are driven by very, very similar issues. You know, there's heavy funding issues for them, there's pricing issues, and survival and relevance is, is equally important in this area as it is in the others. So as you look at where uh, all, the, all the players in the industry are, and you reminisce back possibly to the traditional publishing model that we were all familiar with uh, a few years ago, the, 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 the days of a, of a stable um, publishing model are basically gone. Uh, if we look at this, you know, gone is a simple structure uh, where everybody knew what their role was and stayed in their role. Uh, gone are the clear geographic boundaries that we um, uh, could always count on, uh, primarily because of the, the physical location of everything. Um, gone are the days when um, life centered around a physical inventory. Um, while it's still uh, certainly a concern, uh, it used to be that's all you had to worry about, what you printed, what you put in the warehouse, what you shipped, and that's all changing. Uh, gone are the days of limited players. Uh, the, bar the barriers to entry are down. Uh, very easy for publishers to come in, retailers to start selling content, content to get created. All of that has changed dramatically. And what used to be a publisher-driven um, content model is, is turning into a consumer-driven, uh, author-driven model. Uh, that uh, doesn't, can't be controlled and dictated uh, quite like it could in the past. So it's, it's a wild, wild world out there as this model is transitioning. So obviously the landscape has shifted. Uh, hopefully it's not everyone falling off a cliff, but it has shifted and there are uh, changes ahead, no doubt. Um, in fact, this sign could probably say the change is, is now, uh, and we're in the middle of it. The, um, there, there are several things that are driving this, and we're going to talk about a couple of them and spend a little time on them, the first of which is print technology. Now, lest everyone forget, their books are still about 95, 96% of the market out there are, are still printed books. Um, but things are changing in this area, uh, and the conventionally offset produced book is going is seeing somewhat of a decline in volume, and is going to continue to decline based on uh, information provided by Interquest. And uh, digital printed books will grow uh, quite dramatically. So uh, today, digital printed books account for around four or five percent of all printed books in the United States market um, and, and similar to that around the world. And it's predicted that these will increase to almost 15% by 2015. Just to give you an idea of what that means in terms of books, there are about 3 billion books printed each year in the U.S. And today with 4% being digital, digitally printed, that's a little over 100 million books that are digitally printed. So by 2015, they're saying that 100 million is going to go to somewhere around 450 million. And then there's predictions by 2020 for it to be 25, 30% of the market, which means over a billion books would be printed uh, using digital technology. What's driving that is the, the gap between the cost of digital and the cost of traditional offset publishing is, is closing. Um, and then uh, the, the benefits of digital printing, which are basically uh, print what you need when you need it, or print shorter runs and store them, store less in the warehouse, are, are going to um, drive more publishers and, and more content into this model. And, and that's what's going to drive this to become a bigger and bigger part of the industry. For a publisher, what that means to you is, is um, you don't have to make uh, as big a print run. You don't have to take as much risk with your inventory. You don't have to tie up inventory or capital in inventory. And um, there will be a, a, a continued progression of what I would call a true print-on-demand model, which uses digital printing to store the content and not print it until the sale actually happens. And that's where the true power 
of digital printing and print on demand will, will uh, grow in the future as um, print is distributed out closer to the consumer and printed as it is needed as things get faster and cost comes down. So that's the primary um, issues with the, with the print technology. And uh, then, uh, of course, is everything that's going on in the uh, ebook area as well. <clears throat> and, you know, we're always uh, bombarded with statistics about ebook growth. We're seeing numbers every day. You can see, you know, this stat here 171% over 2009 versus October of 2010. And then the Forrester number here. Uh, prognosticating, you know, massive growth. But, you know, there's no denying that the growth is staggering and the, that it's a very, very significant change in the industry and how people are reading. Um, no one really knows where all these numbers are going to head. Um, some people say, you know, five years, uh, it's going to be the dominant form of reading. Some say 10, some say sooner. But I think no one would deny that it is moving really, really quickly and, and that change is really upon us. Um, and it's mainstreaming in a very, very interesting way. I think we all know the story about the Amazon Kindle, a uh, best-selling product ever through Amazon. That's a, that's a huge change in the last two years, and that is just going to continue to grow and grow. Um, also, we know that, uh, you know, from surveys, Lots of, lots of Internet users say they plan to buy a Kindle or some other e-reader in the next year. The New York Times now has a, be, a best-selling e-book list, which I think is tremendous. And Barnes & Noble reported really, really strong holiday results uh, and the, based on really on the popularity of the Nook. And we also know that consumer uh, behavior is really changing. Um, you know, Internet users are spending a ton of time on social media and other on, uh, online activity. Um, and social media really, really has become the new word of mouth. That's how people hear about things, how, how we spread all the information or much of the information that we're getting right now. This last bullet is pretty fascinating to me. Um, you know, 25% uh, of children between 9 and 17 think that reading text or texting back and forth uh, counts as reading. I have to say that uh, I don't think a single one of my texts would count as reading in any way, shape, or form, but uh, obviously lots of people between 9 and 17 years old do. Um, you know, some really good news out of Barnes & Noble uh, following the holiday. They had a really, really strong year, again, bolstered somewhat by the Nook, but also they had a really good Christmas holiday season um, in physical book sales. So that was good news, especially given... Um, the news about borders and the financial difficulties that borders facing. Um, for those of us dealing on the, you know, the print side of the book business and brick and mortar stores, you know, this is a, a concerning development. But also independents are looking to carve out their niche and stay relevant. And we heard some pretty good news from independent stores uh, on their results from the holidays as well. So we're also involved in a, in a period of, of content explosion. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it's no longer just a publisher-driven world of content. It's being driven by, by the authors, the consumers, the, the, the users out there with, with no barriers to entry virtually to bring content to the market. Another, another trend that's going on is the self-publishing uh, trend. It, it continues to grow, and, and uh, print-on-demand has been a, a, a primary place for this, for this part of the industry. Um, the number of new books, and, and these are stats, the latest stats that were out because the 2010 numbers have not come out. Um, new numbers of books created in 2008 versus 2009 was up dramatically, nearly doubled. But um, the 2010 numbers are going to be interesting because I'll just give you a, just a little nugget of information here. At Lightning, going into 2010, we had about a million and a half titles in our library, and uh, over the, just the 12-month period, we added over four million new titles. Uh, so it's 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 an, it is an explosion, and that's a that's a good way to phrase it. Uh, now a lot of that is uh, is the the public domain content and people going back, uh, bringing back centuries worth of content 
back to the market so that people can see it and read it. Um, but uh, beyond that, there's, there's quite a bit of customized content being generated, uh, personal publishing models um, that go anywhere from someone creating a photo book uh, up to uh, family history and those type of things, things that don't even get an ISBN that we don't see in the traditional book business. It's all part of this content explosion. So, uh, as you can see, it is a complex world, and uh, um, if you start looking at, at, at how you manage all this, I think you start to, we'll get into talking a little bit about, about what we see and, and what we see publishers doing. But publishers have got to deal with a very a complex array of issues and, at the same time, opportunities in this world. You've got major issues and, and complications with managing the new digital world, with things like digital asset management, uh, file distribution challenges, concerns with security, dealing with multiple formats, uh, all kinds of things that, that are brought on by that market. You've got some of the print technologies that we talked about that are, that are driving uh, just on time or just in time uh, print solutions where you sell the books in print, uh, lower print runs, uh, all kinds of things, uh, issues with warehouse, uh, you know, how much warehouse do I need and whether I should even have a warehouse, and those type of things are making it a very complex world. I mean, I also think a couple of uh, other elements, uh, you know, global markets with no boundaries. This is, uh, you know, especially true with e-content, but it's also really becoming true with print content as well. And then within the industry itself, you know, the shifting Salesforce focus. Um, you know, publishers are looking at how to grow sales, and they're looking at markets where they've traditionally deployed their sales forces, and are now looking to new markets to sell into. Um, you know, or they're just outsourcing that activity to someone else. But there's definitely a shift going on within the industry, within publishing and distribution companies on how they deploy their sales forces. So uh, now that we've shared some of the, the present, uh, we thought it'd be put on our uh, seer hat here and peer into the future a little bit and see what's around the corner, what you know, could be you know, the next corner or a few corners down the way. Uh, so e-books are going to be a dominant format. You know, many, many people are using the five-year mark as that point, the years may differ, but the concept, concept is certainly sound and is going to happen. Sell then print. Uh, this is here now, as Larry has talked about, and you've heard some staggering numbers from him on digital printing technology and consumer buying behavior is changing how we meet that demand, the, the demand of the reader right now. We also heard from Larry about the content explosion. This doesn't look like it's going to slow down anytime soon. And content for niche publishers, in my, in my personal experience, oftentimes working with small, very focused publishers, uh, you know, niche publishers have done extremely well in all kinds of climates um, in publishing. And they can always find niche readers, uh, but even more so now, I think readers are more focused and publishers are more focused in meeting their needs. On the consumer side, you know, uh, consumers have already shown that they love ebooks for the convenience and accessibility, but ultimately, most ebooks today are the same as print, just in digital form. So we're going to see some, you know, demand for enhancements and interactivity with ebooks. Uh, and despite the hype around self-publishing via the web, publishing houses are going to play an even greater role in an ebook world. Commodity content is everywhere and largely free. So high quality vetted, edited content, which takes a staff of experts, we think is going to be worth the premium. And uh, it's important that publishers find ways to connect with these communities, uh, online social communities, in a meaningful way and make it an emotional investment in what people uh, using these mediums are interested in. For libraries, um, you know, we know that libraries are going to embrace digital. We think this is a great opportunity for publishers to find new ways to involve libraries in the digital push. Early success will create loyalty with this market, we think. 
Uh, libraries will also grow their collections via patron-driven models. We know the library budgets have been slashed in the last two years, more than in the previous two decades. And this has created demand for a patron-driven model that's essentially 100% return on investment. Uh, and we know that libraries will be forced to reinvent themselves to remain relevant. You know, similar to how publishers have the opportunity to become more relevant by helping to filter out the noise in the content world, libraries must similarly change their role and adapt systems to become more of a resource to their users. And on the retail side, um, you know, we know that it's inevitable that some brick and mortar bookstores will go away in markets uh, where the demand has decreased. It's just uh, inevitable, it's been happening. And we also know that other stores will open. So there'll be a shift, and there'll be a continual shift in the brick and mortar area. We also know that retailers are gonna expand internationally as the world demands more English language content and boundaries collapse due to local printing. Um, you know, it's gonna become a much more international market. They're gonna diversify and expand their selections in order to engage new customers. You know, Amazon's an example where people go and they know what they want. People browse bookshops for the pleasure of, uh, of the experience. And people are gonna to have to continue to expand and diversify their selection. And we also know they're gonna grow in, in cyberspace. Amazon will see more traffic as readers come back to reload their Kindles, buy more books, and for all the other devices, there's going to be greater demand for outlets as well. Um, for educators, we also know that they're going to move more aggressively towards digital. You know, you read daily about the examples and the trials and experiments with e-textbooks in the classroom in both K-12 and higher education. Um, we should look for cost considerations to drive more adoptions as content becomes more widely available. There will also be more virtual online courses. With the influx of e-content, it's just easier, cheaper, and more convenient to offer online courses. But online courses have also grown uh, due simply to demand from the non-traditional student looking to continue their education. They're gonna be more fully integrated. Schools will incorporate learning content into their online course management systems and publishers may find it advantageous to partner with technology companies in what they do. We also know educators are gonna to have to adapt to tomorrow's students. A completely digital classroom is on the horizon, and tomorrow's students will begin using e-learning technologies even in kindergarten. And that educators are gonna demand more and better content from publishers. As in libraries, publishers will again be positioned to help drive content decisions as their expertise will be required by the leading educational institutions to provide the highest quality learning materials. So, you know, how does a publisher thrive in this new environment? And I think the key phrase there is thrive. Um, a lot of people like to, to look at all this going on and think of gloom and doom, but um, I, I think one of the main themes we want to, to push today is that we see this as a huge time of opportunity. So as you look at what, um, what publishers have to realize in this environment, in order to thrive during these times of transformation, they, they need to completely rethink their distribution business models and build a business that can quickly and constantly adapt to the relentless change in technology and consumer behavior. It's a very, a very powerful statement and there are lots of pieces in there. This is no easy task at all. Um, however, as I said before, the times of change create, uh, of great change create times also of great opportunity. And I think over the next several years, you'll see a uh, new emergence of people who have taken advantage of this opportunity and who thrive in this environment. Of course, there'll be those that don't. Uh, but uh, I, I think if everyone views it as a new opportunity and how do you go um, develop this, then uh, lots of good things can happen for everyone. Um, it gives you an opportunity to create and deliver new content to new markets where, and consumers maybe that you've never been able to reach before. So what are your options as a publisher in this environment? Well, one is you could do nothing 
and and uh, hang on to the old model. Just hang in there, and, and we, we wish you good luck. And I, I imagine there will be some that will, and we'll have a niche that they'll do fine there. Um, second option is to move to somewhat of a completely digital model with zero inventory. Now, surprisingly, a lot of people are already there because they, they came into the the ebook, the POD model, uh, from from the beginning that way, and, and didn't have the legacy of warehouses or inventory, or or the traditional model, and more and more people will move there. But realistically, the, the third option is is where a lot of us, uh, most publishers, are going to find themselves, and this is somewhat in a transition, a transition, in a mix between traditional physical inventory, print on demand. Uh, and ebooks, um, and that's probably where uh, you know most everyone's going to find themselves. And and the, the challenge will be, of course, how do you how do you pull that pull that off? Other issues to consider as you look at all this complexity and and all these things, how much of this do I try to do myself? Uh, think of it as a build or buy strategy. Do you go build this? Do you go buy it? Do you go find partners to do it with? You have to ask yourself, do I have the right skills and resources? These are very different skills and resources than what the publishing market uh, was used to years ago, and, and it's changing dramatically, uh, as we all know. Uh, and, and the last thing to consider is not only how do I – how do I, what do I do today to be successful, but how do I anticipate where I need to be to be successful? And this is a, um, a hockey analogy that, that, that tends to say, skate to where the puck's going to be, not where it was, or else you'll miss it. Um, and so how are you going to position yourself for this future and, and where things are going to be? So if, if, you ask, if you ask us how do publishers thrive in this environment, um, if we were going to uh, suggest that you focus or, or, or uh, focus on one thing, it is focus on what you do best and find good partners to help with the rest. Uh, some of the publishers, uh, the larger publishers, will have resources and capital to attempt to do this all on their own. Uh, but it is very complex and very many uh, new and different things to figure out. And partners are going to be the key to that success. So as you look to the future for publishers, publishers are, are going to have to address this complex uh, array of issues and systems needed for digital asset management and distribution. This is not a simple world. Uh, multiple formats, multiple channels, multiple pricing models, multiple geographies, issues with security, all things that um, you, you need an expert, you need someone you can work with in, in that environment because it is, it is very complex. Second of all, um, you're going to see publishers looking to reduce and in some cases eliminate physical inventory and warehouse space. Um, as they, uh, you're going to see, I think, a lot of uh, large publishers who will seek to bring other clients into their warehouse and then you'll see a lot of publishers uh, that will be looking to go to these uh, outsource op, uh, places to to uh, manage their infrastructure and warehouse, and uh, and as the as the physical print and and stored volumes uh, decline, there will be few and few uh, more of these warehouses. Uh, so they will they will seek out uh, solutions to provide physical logistics and warehouse services. And finally, this, this uh, situation where there are no global barriers, um, you're, they'll be seeking out distribution partners capable of the speed to market and efficiencies and global re reach that allow you to reach these new markets. So as you look at, at what the publisher is going to be doing and what they're going to be facing, I'm going to go back to this um, um, publisher decision and, and, and trying to figure out what to do in this marketplace and, and think of it as a, a build and buy checklist. And if down the left side you, you listed all the, the various tasks and functions that a, that a publisher uh, has, to, 
has to look at in the market and to deliver their content to the, to the consumer. Uh, I think a publisher will need to, to closely look at this list and decide from a strategic standpoint what their core competencies are and what they should focus on in the future. Because it, for 95% of the publishers out there, it's too complex to try to do all yourself. Uh, so looking at this uh, scorecard and deciding strategically where you want to buy and where you want to build is, is very important. If you looked in the marketplace out there, you've got, um, I think, kind of three buckets that people, people play in and, and where, they, um, uh, where their expertise lies. Content development, obviously, uh, this is where the publisher skill is. Content distribution could be an array of print distribution and digital partners out there. And then, of course, the channels that, that uh, are tied to the eyeballs and to the consumers in the marketplace whose expertise lies in selling the content. So if you're a publisher, you know, you're probably at some point asking the question, who should I partner with? Um, um, and, you know, there's a, a bunch of different options available. Uh, remember this slide we went through earlier? You know, there are, it's a complex world and there are a lot of providers who offer individual services, manage various relationships and solutions. Um, you know, there are a lot of good companies out there and there are a lot of great options for publishers right now. But it's very, very complex and that has to be taken into consideration. You know, you can also look uh, for providers who can offer an integrated uh, solution from one single source, print on demand, digital, full service, or wholesale. You also have to think about a global reach. Um, you know, the, 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 the back to the concept of publishing uh, without borders. Uh, you have to have a global solution for your company without question. And, you know, we think Ingram might be one of those options. Um, Ingram offers a full, uh, full suite of solutions for publishers. Um, Catherine did a very nice intro in the beginning, you know, talking about some of the things that we do. And, uh, you know, that we think we're one of the options at least to consider in when you're looking for solutions. Um, and, you know, one idea might be a division of labor. You know, that just might be the best approach for some publishers at this point, with each party doing what they do best. Um, publishers are absolutely the best at content creation, design, and author management. There are a lot of other players in the market that uh, you know handle very various elements, you know, outside of that sales, printing, distribution, etc. And uh, we happen to be one of those people that have an integration great solution for that. Um, so, you know, in closing here, um, you know, Ingram has a full suite of services. We do, uh, if you focus on content development, we'll focus on distribution and sales. That's one opportunity to consider as you look across the broad sweep of options that are in front of you. So as you look at uh, what some publishers have actually done, we thought we'd take a, a minute or two and, and take you through some examples. Uh, one of those uh, is Macmillan, a uh, very large publisher who obviously has resources and capabilities to do a lot of those things on that checklist that we just looked at, and they, and they do them. Uh, they recently um, entered into an agreement with us to, um, to look at content maybe that is, is on what they call the long tail, uh, but actually for a lot of publishers is the beginning of the tail. Um, and, uh, they're looking at books maybe that sell less than uh, 1,000 to 2,000 a year to move into a, a, a print-on-demand model. They needed transition from that physical uh, environment where they have inventory already on hand that they need to sell down as they do this transition. So uh, they, they uh, came to us with a, with a business need for us to take over not only the print-on-demand side of that um, that business, but also to take on the physical inventory that they already had and to, to help manage that transition uh, over the next several years. So, I mean, that's an example of a, 
of publisher looking at what they uh, wanted to focus on and what they didn't and, and partnering with someone to do what they didn't want to have and didn't have the skill necessary to do that, that focused on the print on demand uh, print on demand area. Um, I think another publisher we might talk about here is Zondervan. Um, Ingram Publisher Services started working with Zondervan in November of 2010. I think back to the notion of you know, redeploying sales forces and how to reach markets that you're not particularly reaching uh, to your maximum you know, desire. Uh, Zondervan selected Ingram Publisher Services to manage their sales into the independent bookseller market, into the specialty and gift market, you know, markets that they didn't feel like they were reaching, um, and that we have a very, you know, good strength and distribution uh, capability into. Uh, another one I would pick, I would mention here is Springer. Um, in uh, October of 2010, we signed an agreement with Springer to basically start handling their U.S. distribution and print-on-demand services um, for all of their titles in this domestic market. Um, also, we just signed a deal with the University Press of Kentucky for our digital asset distribution model. So there's a lot of different publishers doing a lot of different things, and this just happens to be a list of publishers in the last 12 months that we've signed deals with and, and are examples of what publishers are thinking about how they're thinking about changing their models and how they're potentially using, um, you know, third-party partners to manage pieces of their business that traditionally they've done themselves. So, in closing, and just kind of summarize what what our message has been today. Um, this is obviously a time of rapid change, but this rapid change is creating opportunities for those who embrace it and, and those who can manage to it. Uh, we also feel it is incredibly complex uh, and very few publishers have the resource and the skill and the capability to do it all. And so the, a publisher in this environment needs to sit down and decide what it is they want to focus on, what they want to build and what they want to buy, and, and, and build that from a strategic standpoint, and then seek partners uh, that will enable the publisher to focus on those strategic things that will make them successful and, um, and partner with someone that, that uh, has the capability to take them where they need to go in the future. So uh, we appreciate you giving us the time today to, to spend with you and uh, we'll open up for any questions now. Hi, Larry and Mark. I, this is Catherine here. Before we Hello. jump into questions, I just want to thank you for the um, fascinating discussion of the future of publishing. This is something, well, being in the business, that we can listen to all day long here. And I thought we had a great discussion in the chat room, too. So um, are, are you gentlemen ready for some questions? Sure, sure. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the beginning and, and jump into uh, some from the very beginning. And one was by Whitney, who's asking, um, so if, if we're going to see more books published digitally, are bookstores just going to become showrooms for books that we purchase digitally? Um, you know, I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, I, you know, I think the interesting thing to think about in, you know, certainly in the near term anyway, I don't think that's the case. You know, Larry's stat that 96% of books bought right now are physical books, that's a dynamic physical book, you know, situation in a bookstore. That's not a, you know, that's not a display. That is, you know, actively engaging booksellers and readers in, in a relationship. Whether that becomes the case in the future, it's really, really impossible to tell, but I don't see, frankly, if that becomes the case as much of a business model there for publishers, I mean, for booksellers to really be in the business of, you know, uh, being a display space. You know, perhaps one way to think of it is that it's another outlet for social networking. Uh, and if you think about what even some of the chains have done over the years where they started serving coffee and, 
and made it more of a social site to go to go sit and participate in, in the book experience. I, I think that will continue and they won't go away. They will embrace digital. They'll probably embrace a lot of other things in the experience uh, to bring readers together. Okay, that's, that's a very good point. Um, and there's, I think a lot of people are worried about that because being in the book business, we all love our bookstores, but still the digital books have a lot of appeal. Now let's see, uh, Joseph asked a question when you were talking about the decline of conventional uh, book printing versus uh, the growth of digitally produced books. He wanted to know how you arrived at those numbers. Is that based on a linear projection? Uh, those numbers came out of an interquest study, um, and uh, they put out a, uh, a study. Of the last one, I think, was 2007, then they did an updated version of it uh, just recently that came out. Uh, they do surveying. They survey publishers. They survey vendors. Uh, they try to take a stab at where the market is today and, and, and where it's growing, and, and that's where those numbers came from. Uh, and okay. you know, as, as a participant in that industry, I, I think they're, I think they're pretty close. Okay. So um, then Ruth was asking, when will the cost of uh, POD come down for re book retailers? Um, I, I guess uh, I'm not sure. I totally understand the, the question from a. From the standpoint of a retailer, if they're buying a book that's produced by print-on-demand, um, how it's produced should be transparent to them, um, whether it's printed on demand or printed uh, in the offset traditional way. Uh, it didn't used to be that way, but the quality now is, is getting so close it's, it's very hard to tell the difference. Now, if the question is how, does, how soon before uh, print-on-demand could be in a retail shop, uh, there are several business models out there today that that are are trying to make that transformation, and um, uh, one of which is Espresso, who is teamed with Xerox, and then there there are other vendors that that I know are looking at the space. Um, those will serve a niche. I don't know that they'll be a replacement for uh, the traditional uh, book channel of uh, for most books, but they'll be a way for for content to get to a store that may not carry that that uh, uh, store, or um, carry that inventory in a store, or uh, remote locations like uh, uh, libraries or places in the world where it's not feasible to ship books. So. Okay, uh, David uh, made a ask a question or made a comment uh, uh, along the same lines, and he said. One barrier to eliminating physical inventory with a print-on-demand has been the inability to drop ship uh, via LSI, for example, and charge the shipping to the consumer. Um, he says uh, they often require us to use their shipping accounts, which means we have to have inventory on hand and have it printed and shipped to us before it can be reshipped to a customer. So he said it seems like that could be an easy fix. Um, do you have a comment on that? Um, we we do ship on behalf of a publisher directly to consumers every day. Uh, I think what he's talking about is whether we had a, a retail site or a way for the um, uh, consumer to, to buy it right there and have it shipped directly to them. I, I, but I'm guessing there if that's the, the point that, that he's making. Um, when we ship, uh, we you know, we have a, a shipping charge, but it's the typical UPS uh, shipping rate. So uh, I, I'm not sure if I answered the question or not. But okay, so you're saying that, for instance, bookstores don't need to maintain a supply, an inventory of a certain book. They can place the order for their customer and have it shipped directly to them without... Well, um, it, it, it's confusing a little bit. When you're talking about publishers, Placing an order t to Lightning, we can print and drop ship that on behalf of the publisher wherever they want it to go. Retailers okay. typically come through Ingram, and Ingram has capability called customer direct fulfillment that they have with retailers 
that allow the retailer to place an order through Ingram, and Ingram drop ships that book on behalf of the retailer to the consumer. So um, okay. to, to say that a bookstore doesn't have to have inventory, there's obviously inventory they'll want to keep, but they can show, for instance, 5 million books on, on hand with 24-hour delivery um, through their Ingram systems, and those books, um, only maybe a million of them are on hand at Ingram, and the, the, the rest are in a digital library that can be printed in less than three or four hours, sent over to Ingram, and shipped to the consumer. Okay, got it. So um, let me see. Uh, I'm sorry, I had a. So back to um, Robert had a question on what is the true value that publishers add. And he, he was saying it, it seems that it's to identify a mass market interest and then market to that. Um, but it, I think I don't really understand exactly what he's saying because then he further went on to say the printing, distribution, editing, and so on can be done by authors themselves. So, so um, what advantage yeah. is there to go through the publisher? I guess we all ask that all the time too. Well, I think it comes back to the notion of, uh, of selection and curation and bringing expertise to, to an art, right? Um, you know, publishers are really in a position to, to take um, an author's work to select, you know, the work that they believe is the best work that they should be presenting as a publisher and bring it to the public. And, you know, I, I think that that role will, will not really change. Uh, I think it will continue to be very important and uh, a strong part of what happens with books and how books get published into, um, into society. Well, James, I think, had an interesting question that sort of tells on that. Uh, he wanted to know, do you think that traditional publishers are the only uh, source of quality vetted content? Uh, no, I, I don't think they're, they're, they're the only ones, and um, I think to some extent you get a whole lot. I mean, for instance, we deal here at Lightning, I think now over 19,000 publishers, and um, so I, I know there's high quality content in there, um, and I also know there's not. <laughs> there's some that isn't, so um, I, I think I, I think the point is that certain publishers will build a brand and a recognition and a trust that people will um, trust that if they bring it to them, it's it's gone through a certain level. That doesn't mean that everything is that's the only place to get good quality. It only means that it went through some barriers process, and some yeah. and a process to hopefully um, ensure that it reached a certain level of quality. Okay, so not not the only source of quality, but you should be able to um, believe with some confidence that uh, going through a publisher does yeah, I think guarantee that's a true. certain level of quality at least. Yeah, but, I think uh, that's that's true. But but I I would say we've had some bestsellers come out of of content that came up through individual authors. So uh, it's it's just it's you know it's. It's uh, just a little harder to find, and often well, those that, books, their next book ends up being published by yeah. <laughs> a traditional <laughs> publisher. Right, right. I've yeah. seen that happen. So, um, here's a question: uh, Agatha was asking, are there surveys available, or perhaps any other resources that show how much revenue is generated by self-publishers? And um, I wonder if if you have any information on that. I know that that. They say you can't make much money writing a book these days, no matter how you go. But, but how do self-publishers do? Uh, I don't have information on that. Um, I do get some of, a, somewhat of a view of how um, the industry, if you will, does because um, we we provide printing for most of them, so I see some things. But uh, I don't have a view that I I could comment on on the individual author. Uh, there are some that hit home runs, and there are some that uh, don't sell much at all. 
um, and it's all over the board. Yeah, that's for sure. So here's an interesting question by David, and I, th this has come up in other talks I've listened to too. He says, do you see the possibilities for an API that would allow consumers to customize the text, such as the textbook, from open access digital sources? Um, he says, right now we have to have publisher intervention for the process, and it seems like this is something that, that could be done, like, like Safari books. People should be able to get in and, and customize their books. Well, and I think let me give you an example of where that is being used. Uh, there's actually a client we work with, uh, Wikipedia Press, that you can go into Wikipedia and pull all the, the various content out and make your own book. Uh, for instance, we had some visitors from Brazil, and, and he, he went in and created a, a whole travel book on Brazil, pulling stuff out of Wikipedia. Um, so there, there are places where that can be done, but publishers are going to be real um, reluctant, I think, to allow uh, a piece of content that they've done the work in to develop and to make sure the quality is, is good and that they have to pay royalties off of potentially to, to various people within a, within a book that would be split apart. Um, it gets very complicated to try to, to put a model together that would allow people to go cut and paste and create out of a, a book that a publisher has, has done all that work on to create the content and then has to pay people uh, like authors and such for the use of that content. That's true. I know we had a, another webcast recently with Joe Weikert who was talking about his e-content wish list and one of the things he was talking about was having a uh, digital content or digital textbooks where you could annotate it and share the annotations with, right. with other people and it seemed like that would be a, a great approach for textbooks as well. Yeah, that's, that's happening in the market today and that's part of the ebook revolution. Okay, so oh, we have a lot of questions, but I, we're almost out of time, so let's have one more, if you don't mind. And uh, this comes up a lot, so I want to hear what you, you think about it. What about book piracy? Um, isn't that a publisher concern these days? Well, you know, we, we got that question quite a bit early on with the print-on-demand model. Um, most people may or may not realize that today you can take a printed book and take it to a scanner and in five minutes scan the book and basically have a file that looks as good as that printed book. Um, so pir piracy, uh, first of all, if, if someone wants the book and wants the content, they can create a file that could be sent around. And um, you know how you get around that or how you stop that is, is nearly impossible. There is a tremendous amount of, of um, and very critical uh, in the um, in the in the process of protecting content with uh, what we call digital rights management uh, protection of, of content to keep it from being replicated and stolen. And it's also very important that you partner with with distribution partners who uh, understand this process, understand the people, uh, and 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 have relationships with retailers around the world that you can trust that. Um, uh, you know where it's going and that you're going to get paid for what's put out there. All right. Well, I think we're out of time now, so I want to thank you both very much for presenting today. I also want to thank Ingram for sponsoring this. We're very grateful to you. And um, also thank you to our audience for the wonderful discussion that we had going on throughout this presentation. If you're interested in this topic, you may want to check out the uh, upcoming uh, POC, Tools of Change for Publishers Conference. We have a code for 15% off that. You can find it on the O'Reilly site, and um, I see a lot of you are already going there, so it should be a, a, a good, um, a great uh, discussion going on there. There's so much changing in the publishing world. So thank you, Larry, and thank you, Mark. Thanks, and Catherine. Thanks to the rest of the Ingram Content Group and everyone else. Hope you'll join us again. And I, that's about it. I'm going to close out the chat room now. Bye, everyone. Thank you.